Recording. 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 You muted. Good morning, everybody. It's October 31st. And yeah, it's Sunday. Um, COP starts tomorrow, Halloween tonight. And not a lot of people are on this call, just so with me. But um, yeah, we decided we wanted to have a little, well, I, I decided to have a little rant about uh, geoengineering again. Um, and I posted this video with David Keith. I think he is a psychopathic criminal. And um, yeah, I think he should uh, be put on the set with Alec Baldwin as far as I, I, can, I can tell. Um, Sophie, what, do you, what is your take on that video? You watched it. Yes, I, I watched it too. Yeah, I think you are right, because I think uh, that um, geoengineering is going to be imposed all of a sudden on us without without information, without any choice given to anyone, without discussion. I think it's going to be, as you, as you said before, imposed uh, because of fear and, and, and that people are going to use it as a last resort. Um, I think we need to we need to talk about it. We need to we need to spread the information about it and expose expose the crazy guys who are who are behind this. So I, I know you have a lot to say about this. I le leave you to it. Yeah, I mean I think we should you know the the right thing to do is to take extreme action to shut the conversation down. It, it would be very easy to take drastic actions to make sure that nobody went on this path, basically shock actions. And I think somebody should do it soon. But the just, you see, the danger is that these guys will talk everybody into it. Um, so, you know, this is what I was, I was kind of thinking of doing a response video to the, to that one, but it's, it's, he's a very slimy, slippery character, obviously a psychopath. You can see many times, when he starts his megalomania slips. So he's, he's very cool and calculated and he's got this rational, you know, PhD, I'm the sanest person in the room, you know, kind of persona. And he'll fool a lot of people. He is an out and out psychopath. You can see it in every, you know, when his mask start, drops. Like he says things which are, he, he, he's not self-aware enough, he's self-aware enough to come off uh, to fool you know, 50% of the audience. But he's not self-aware enough that he doesn't see his mask drop. So, for example, he said something, to give you an idea of the megalomania of this freak, is he said, you know, uh, in the question time in that video, he was saying, well, you know, we, we have to think in terms of, you know, what kind of thermostat lever we give, you know, the control that we give to politicians. You know, if they're all crazy, you know, then... We have to make sure that it's you know really dampened down so that it's uh, the response on the on the knob is really low because you know you don't want crazy people in a bar fight to be fiddling with the knob. But then if they're really rational and you know sane people, then you you might you know they're really wise, then you might want to give a big response on the lever. And so like I cannot tell you how how crazy this talk is for for, for starters. Imagine the megalomania of this character. He's, he 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 as a as a lunatic fringe scientist think that the scientists get to set the lever and the parameters of the knob and that you know then they hand it over to the politicians it's like it's so insane you just don't know where to start it's, it's like as if the politicians are all one block if the United Nations or anything it's, it's like you know the, there's no one thermostat for everybody to fight over anybody can do geoengineering. Pakistan can do it tomorrow. India can do it tomorrow. And by, by progressing the science, he's, he thinks, 
well, we're all going to come to a consensus about whether we should do it or not. And it's like, no. How, how, where does that lunatic assumption come from? You could do all the science, and India could come to the conclusion, well, it's very, very well, you know, it's very apropos for India. And America and Europe could say, this is insanity. It's like, you know, it's it's so barking mad to go down this road that beggars belief. But you see, he he, what he's doing is he's uh, he's perfecting. He's he's been at this for so long. He's perfecting the arguments, so they become very slick. And uh, and so, uh, you know, at first people just freak out and go, "This guy's crazy. I'm I'm not gonna play with the planet. Are you are you nuts?" And then you know the shock value wears off, and you can see what he's doing. Uh, him and Bill Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates, they they want to. At the moment, it's a very incestuous conversation. There are really twenty people in, uh, um, that are really driving all the papers that are written on it. They're just a crazy bunch, but they're backed by billionaires. So they, he's saying, well, we need to widen the conversation, which sounds plausible and nice. But what he's saying is we need to habituate the public to this conversation. So when we've talked it out enough and I've given all these rational arguments and then I've got all these stupid people on board, and uh, then they'll start exactly like you know what we saw about bright green lights. It's the same deal. It's like you know, it, it, over, over time, people will get to think that it's sane because enough sane people will be there talking in this rational, smooth, slimy, snake-like voice that always fools everybody. So, so Dr. Strangelove will sweet talk and this, the public into doing this insanity. And, it, and it's all by these pseudo-rational arguments that are so short-sighted. Uh, it's hard, you know, it's one of these things that is so wrong and so stupid it's it's hard to get a handle on it. It's it's one of these things like it's one of these big lies, where it's like it's it's so dumb it's not even wrong that kind of thing, and so that makes it extremely dangerous to even get into the discussion, let alone to propagate the science. So okay, let let me show you for an example why this is so idiotic and why these people are so fucking dangerous. These psychopaths is like okay. Uh, he he responded to one thing in the in the video that I mentioned before, and that's about. Funnily enough, he came up with exactly the same analogy I did, which was pilot-induced um, oscillation, right? And so, so I was explaining to you about helicopters and how you know your overcorrection and stuff happens, um, and he kind of acknowledged that the, that that is an issue. He just doesn't realize how much of an issue it is. So. Um, just just one thing on that pilot induced oscillation. When the first time I ever saw it, I saw I've seen a 747 crash <laughs> with that pilot induced oscillation when when I was about a nine year old. Luckily, it was in a simulator. But I, my cousin is an airline pilot or retired now, but for South African Airways. And when I was about nine years old, he took me in a simulator. In those days, it wasn't electronic. It had a, like a big model with a camera that ran along. So this huge model world, and then this camera ran along. You can see little houses and trees. Very, very cool. But one of the pilots, uh, they set the minima so that he broke cloud and he was on the wrong side of the runway. And this is a 747 simulator. He's he's a senior pilot, and he he tr he banked hard to try and get the the plane back on track, and when he tried to level the wings again, he overcorrected. And he got into this oscillation. We overcorrected this way, then he overcorrected that way, and the whole thing piled into the ground. This is an actual realistic simulation with, with a, a qualified senior captain that you know was going to go and fly a real 747s the next day. And I saw him crash this thing. Um, and I got such a vivid picture about overcorrecting. And then since, I mean, I've since you know, seen controls boats and planes and stuff and and so you know uh, this this here's a, the number of things that um, are wrong in David Key's thinking so he's saying he addressed okay let's just go through 
just control them. And so he's saying, well, no, it is controllable because of feedback. No, it's uncontrollable because of feedback. So for this is how a control system works. So it's basically the same. What he's proposing is, is the same as any cybernetic control system that the cyberneticists were talking about, Norbert Wiener and all of those guys, McCulloch and Shannon, and they're all talking about feedback and um, control systems. And so uh, particularly for gun, you know, World War II anti-aircraft guns and stuff like that. So it's all about radar and tracking and the, you know, the having the gun um, traverse and things like that. So it's a, um, uh, so, so what these systems are pretty much like a standard um, autopilot on, on a yacht like this one. So what they have then is that you set up the course you want to steer, like, you know, 300, zero, zero, and then they have two parameters that you can tweak. One's called the gain and one's called the response. So the gain is what he was talking about was, you know, how much uh, the, the thermostat reacts when you turn. So it's, in other words, um, when the course drifts off and you start getting a deviation, the gain says, well, when do I start correcting? When it's like 305 degrees or whether it's 310 degrees or when it's 295 degrees. Or it's like, when do I start responding? And then the second parameter is the response. And that's how much do I turn the rudder when I respond? So now think of it is when, if you set it wrong, you'll see something like this. You'll see it start to hunt. And so it will go, say, left a little bit then you, you've set the gain uh, too much. If you set the gain and the response too much, it'll say, for example, start going to, right, to the right. You'll start seeing it go to starboard. Then um, it will realize it's off course, and then it would kick hard on the rudder. And then it would come rapidly swinging, and the swing would pass through your heading, 300, your proposed heading, and then it would pick up somewhere around 296. And then it would pick up, oh, it's on the port side. And then it would swing again too aggressively over. And each time the swing's getting bigger and bigger until basically you will eventually start uh, getting a chaotic uh, result. Now, he realizes that's, that's the danger. But it, it needs emphasis on how stupid he is. Because to get that measurement, uh, is extremely difficult. Okay, for one one thing is he 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 says something. I must just take a deviation there about the the chaos. He got the other thing that I said, which, which what I was saying on these things. It's almost like he listens to them. <laughs> it's like um, that uh, about chaos. So obviously people have told him, no, it's a chaotic system. You can't control it. Here's the biggest fuck up he made in the whole video, and this is where he's completely out of his depth and why he needs to be euthanized, basically. He needs to be shut the fuck up because this is dangerous talk. He's saying, no, just because it's chaotic does not mean we, control, we, we can't control it. Yes, it fucking does, you moron, you PhD fuckhead. It's, he's saying, no, and he gives a, a little, you know, spin, you know, that's, if you know anything about that plane that he, f he flashed up, it's, it was made to be dynamically unstable. It's a fighter plane prototype, and it was from some X program. And, the, and it was, um, you know, so that planes can be more maneuverable. If you make them stable, then you have to overcome the inertia, and then that's not a safety thing, and that's kind of what the response or the correction is all about. Now, if you make them dynamically unstable, it means they, they're ready to tumble out of the air at any moment. So then they respond very, very quickly to control inputs because they're dynamically unstable. Here's the thing that he's missing. That plane, right, is uh, in sort of a chaotic regime, but it's controlled by a computer. If that computer goes off for, for a, a second, that plane will tumble out of the sky. The pilot has to eject. That computer is making control corrections on the millisecond boundary. It's, it's, it's making thousands and thousands of, of corrections every single second just to keep the plane in the air and flying. 
Now think about that. He is comparing the, the climate where you get one chance to experiment with, right? And he's comparing it to this plane. This plane was developed over decades and they, they, they can control the chaos because with thousands and thousands of experiments, they found the envelope of the chaos of where the chaos was contained. Then they could get the computer to actually do all these course corrections. It took a very long time and thousands and thousands of errors. With the planet Earth, you only get one fucking chance. So you, it's a completely false analogy. In fact, it's an analogy to prove that you shouldn't be doing this. Because the very fact that they, they had to explore the boundary of chaos for that plane means that you will not be able to do that with the Earth. Therefore, you should not be fucking around with it. So this idea that, oh, we can contain the chaos is, is absolute bullshit. He's thinking, well, you can start slowly. You can ramp up very cautiously, tickle the tail of the dragon. And then, you know, if something goes, goes wrong, we can, like, pull back. Say, no, you're being a complete moron. Think about it. Yeah, it's, it's just so bad. It's, it's hard to know where to even start. It's so stupid. Okay, look, the temperature is changing all the time, right? So it's changing between the day and the nighttime temperature. It's changing with the seasons. So if you're looking at the global average temperature, right? And you're saying like, exactly where do you set the response? Do you reset the response to the daily temperature? Obviously not. Obviously you would take a moving average. So then from how long? You take a moving average back to the industrial revolution? Of course not. Because then it would be too damp and down. So where's the sweet spot where it's just enough, you know, running average from the, you know, that evens out the yearly temperature cycle, the seasonal cycles, the daily cycles, and it's smooth enough. And then you can actually read and respond and respond to it. Is it a year? Is it 18 months? Is it two years? You're just fucking guessing. No one knows. And you cannot be sure enough with a climate model to say, oh, the correct moving average to basically be the the meter that we work on. So that's you know how we interrogate the system and how we measure exactly what our response is. It, is you cannot do that with models. The models are not designed to do that kind of thing. It doesn't matter if you put four parameters in. There are literally millions of parameters in the climate system. So you would be a moron if you even attempted this. But think about what they what he's going to do if he was allowed to do this insanity. He would, he's thinking, oh, you know, it's like Mount Pinatabo. We've seen Mount Pinatabo. It blew up. And then, you know, nature's done a lot worse with Earth and stuff. So we would just be, you know, ticking the tail of the dragon. We'd start small. We'd start putting some sulfates up in the atmosphere and carry on and, you know, increase and increase and increase slowly. What could go wrong? Well, I'll tell you what could go wrong. For starters, Mount Pinatabo could go up again. Then you could see something, you know, maybe temperatures would plummet. And then you'd say, well, is it Mount Pinatabo or is it you? Was it all the accumulation of the stuff you did? You've got you've got two weeks to stop, right? So then what, what happened? So, so here's the thing is he's thinking way too linearly. He doesn't understand chaos. Now, something that's relevant to his fucked up thinking is is the wind scale so i posted that video about wind scale by the way just as an aside is you've got your climate action bojo's about to announce that that britain's going full-on nuclear that's going to be its primary um climate action so great work activists you just fucked up the you you've just set yourself up for for fukushima because you know Nuclear plants get shut down when the temperature goes up. If they get cut off from the grid, they go Fukushima. So brilliant job. Well done. It's all those years of climate activism have turned into your, your great wet dream. So anyway, that aside, if you look at that video about what happened at Windscan, that is an example of, of self-organized criticality. So th this is very much the type of thing that happens. I know this from making <laughs> a glass furnace, a microwave glass furnace. So, so what they're seeing in, in that 
that pile that they have at Winsco. Right, they, they have a big graphic pile, and then what they found was you've got a hotspot in, in, the, in the, the carbon. Right, the carbon is, is the, um, the inhibitor of the nuclear reaction. Right? But when it gets, you see what's happening in it, and they must have known it, is it's starting to, to run away. When you see that run away, they should have shut down Winsco, right? Because it is chaotic. They, they are and with certainty going to get into that accident that happened. You see, what they did was they, they controlled it with, with a very bad practice. It's kind of, ex, kind of analogous to solar radiation management. It's, if you get a hot spot, what's happening is you're getting thermal runaway in a spot. You're getting feedback in that tiny spot. So the more, uh, the more it runs away, the more it becomes an absorber, and the more it absorbs, the more heat it generates, and so you get the picture. It's a feedback loop. <clears throat> now, to break that feedback loop, what they did was, they, they counterintuitively, you might think, they brought the entire reactor pile, they brought the temperature up high, higher than the hotspot. So that then it's no longer running away just in that area. It's making a much bigger domain where, where it's heated. Then when you bring the whole thing back down again, everything anneals properly. It's kind of like an Ising spin model where everything has a domain where it's starting to spin in the hot spot. And then you say like, okay, I will scramble everything up again, bring the temperature down. Now it's more homogeneous. And you, you kind of ring a little. What you're doing is critically, critically dangerous. Because if, if you, exactly what happened is that they, they started to find that when they brought it down, there were lots of hotspots. So then, then the whole thing ran away in, in many areas and, and caught fire. That's what happened at Winsgate. Now you have to imagine doing exactly the same kind of thing on a planet-wide scale. So here, David Keith is thinking like a linear thinking lunatic mad scientist with all these rabid mad dog assumptions, like, for example, that the Earth will heat up uniformly. So one part of his head knows that it won't heat up uniformly because they did tests on that. The other part of his head doesn't understand the uh, so, you know, self-organized criticality and runaway and feedback systems. So that he hasn't put the two together. Because think of this, you might start raising you know, putting sulfates in the stratosphere. Uh, you start cooling the planet, right? But some area might cool or heat much faster. It might get into a feedback loop. So, you know, let's take the Arctic, for example. You might start off going like, oh, this is great. The, look at the freeze in the winter this year. It's fucking awesome. That's the first year. The second year, it's like, oh, shit. The freeze now comes down to Scotland. Oops. Better fuck up. We, we fucked up. Now we'll stop putting up the phosphates because we've obviously overcooked things a little bit. The, the AMOC's probably going to stop overturning or something like that. There are going to be lots of repercussions. Bad news, guys. We, let's let's take, a, take a year off and see what the ice in the Arctic does. Then, then uh, what you might find um, after that is, is it doesn't come back. When you, then somebody would say, exactly like a physicist did at wind scale say, well, try heating up the whole thing. So in other words, they say, well, let's try cooling the planet down all over and, and start up. So, you know, we'll heat the planet up again and then cool it back down again and do this kind of the same thing that they did at wind scale. What happens in, if you, if you do that, you're also in that regime where you might, you might find that when it comes back, it's worse. You see, there's hysteresis in the system. He, you can't get the Earth system, take it up, uh, you know, with, take up the CO2 and all the greenhouse gases, then put aerosol in the stratosphere. So, so say you start off at like, say, one, one, one degree, so 1.1 1 .1 degree or something like over the baseline of the Industrial Revolution, right? So then it's saying, you know, you start off there. You start doing your cooling and you think, well, bring it down you know, one, one degree, right? <clears throat> so he's thinking that, you know, well, actually, no, he does know this, but if you bring it back down one degree, you're not getting in a time machine and going back to the industrial, beginning of the industrial revolution, because 
it's not the atmosphere of the Industrial Revolution. It's filled with greenhouse gases to 420 parts per million CO2, plus this masking effect from the sulfates that you're putting up there. So although the temperature is back to 1.1, it's not the same atmosphere. So you, you can see now he says, oh, well, we ran the models and then, you know, it's actually kind of safe. He does these vector diagrams. Just the fact that he's thinking that way means he should be put in a straitjacket. Because you don't know the regime. Those climate models things are computer models. They toy models. They, they wind up toys. They just basically you can do better with a pen and paper. And so he's thinking that you're in in a safe regime when you park the planet at 430 parts per million. Okay, that's the first idiotic thing, is, is not thinking in terms of what this regime will be in. Uh, the models were not created for 420 parts per million plus sulfates in the atmosphere. They're not designed to model that, to say that it's safe because you've chucked in those parameters and look fine, it's idiotic. So, insane in fact. And so, so, okay, um, that's the first thing. But he's assuming all the stasis and smoothness and stuff. He's assuming that when you bring the planet down back to one degree Celsius again, that, you know, it, that you've got complete control. You've got all the countries online. Everybody's doing this together. And, of course, you're not going to get it that way of some guy like William Nordhaus or something is going to be writing papers saying, you know, this is ridiculous. Why are we doing all this carbon reduction? We've proved that we can control the temperature of the planet. We need to belch out carbon as much as we want. And then you'll get a Nobel Prize for saying the sweet spot for economic growth is here. When with, you know, uh, say 5% dimming, solar dimming, um, is the sweet spot for crop production, for GDP growth. Um, sure, there's, uh, you know, South America and India gets kicked in the nuts and becomes a desert. But if you look at the economics, we can pay India to offset the damage that we do. So the guy's going to get a Nobel Prize for saying that shit. So then, then some guy like David Keith, who's in, who thinks he's going to be the Tsar of, you know, solar radiation management of the globe, He's going to be saying like, no, 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 guys, you can't do that. Because they're like, well, come on, your science, you did the science. You just said that it works, doesn't it? And then he, he's going to be saying, no, you're fucking up my program. I, I need to measure all this stuff. All your extra, C we did the modeling with this CO2, you know, at 420 parts per million. You're taking it up to 450 parts per million and 5% five, 5 solar radiation dimming. So he said, we, we, didn't, we didn't work that out. You see, he's, a, he's so naive to assume that he has this ultimate control, that everything, you know, politically aligned, that people won't be flying over the thermostat, but that he gets to create the thermostat. No, he gets to put all the papers out there, and then you have a social tipping point that, uh, that's, you know, everybody's now okay with, with geoengineering, or someone like Xi Jinping, all these psychopaths that are now totalitarians, they have absolute control. They can go and do it on their own. They don't need David Keith anymore. So he's, he's a megalomaniac. A Fuck it. May I ask a question um, on that, what you're saying there? Um, because we're at the beginning of the of the video, you can hear him contradicting himself, like saying that uh, environmental, environmental um, awareness and geoengineering are and maybe, maybe antagonistic. But then he says, I don't think climate change is a threat to humanity. Or then he says, I don't. I, th I think the biggest threat to humanity is other humans. And then he carries on with what you're describing and his plans. So I was wondering what is going to be, I mean, uh, uh, most people don't understand the physics of what you're talking about. It's a bit difficult for a lot of people who don't have an engineer leaning mind or even, you know, understanding how, how what is chaos. And, and complex systems. So, the reception of um, in the public of, of uh, exposés as as uh, as David Keith does is going to be probably quite good in the light of what COP is going to probably unveil now. And so, what what do we do to what do we do to de <laughs> destroy uh, the message of David Keith? Hmm. 
quick and simple propaganda of the deed. You see, the reason is the this is what, how it's likely to, to unfold. Is he's he's normalizing and habituating people to this idea. So that at first is very, very resistant. Everybody's instinctively resistant. The more uh, then he normalized this craziness, then the more people will be primed to reach for it as a desperate measure. So they're selling it as, look, guys, this is not plan A. This is just having insurance in our back pocket. What they know is that at some point in this catastrophe, people are going to reach for the gun. That, that insurance policy is going to be used. He knows that very well. All he's doing is priming people like a snake. He's, he's you know, putting this idea out there, getting people used to it. This is, Bill, this is Bill Gates talking through him, right? So Bill Gates is, is you know, the Elon Musk and all these other nuts, they're going to go to Mars. Well, Mars is, you know, they're not going to terraform Mars. Mars is not planet B. Mars is not the insurance policy for us fucking up this planet. It's the, Those guys are mega insane and barking mad. But Bill Gates is a little bit smarter than them. And he's like, okay, you guys, you go and do your jerk off, um, you know, race on the moon and stuff to go, go to Mars. And so literally they, they want to race cars. Tesla's on the moon. Oh, God, just fuck. Oh, boy. <laughs> and everybody's loving it, by the way. That Elon Musk now is the richest man uh, of all time. <laughs> Uh, he's the first person to get over three hundred billion dollars, and it's it's nothing. There's nothing there. It's just it's just he's just a con man, and the but the world is loving him because he's like this tech messiah. But Bill Gates is a little bit smarter than him, and Bill Gates's plan is like ah, terraforming Mars is too difficult. You know, populating Mars and terraforming is too difficult. I've got a better idea. I'll populate and terraform a planet closer to home, the blue one. So Bill Gates is thinking he's going to depopulate the Earth and terraform it. And, um, and, and you know, these guys like David Keith are his mouthpiece. So he's, he's playing chess. They're all playing chess with the planet. And so you, the, the public, the game they're playing, the public, I do not have any confidence in the public being able to see through it. The public's just too dumb. So you have to do shock value to make it taboo, right? You need to, you see, if somebody did, uh, you know, you guess you can tell what I'm talking about. If they did that, it would put a chill on it. No, nobody would go there again, right? Every, everybody would say, oh, this is terrible, and we mustn't let this affect science, and we mustn't let, you know, terror, override, rational thinking, and so the science must go on, and they'd all say that, and then you'd find no one would do it. They're all cowards, basically, right? See, David Keith, is he keeps on saying, you know, we mustn't have patents for this technology. They must be owned by the world, and, and um, uh, you know, and then he mentions on the video, oh, well, I don't talk about my day job because it's a conflict of interest, <laughs> and it's like, you snake. He... he on record of saying, you know, there's going to be tons and tons of money to be made by whoever owns the technology for geoengineering. So he thinks he's going to be czar of the world, and he's going to be making making out like a billionaire. Um, and so, yeah, he, there's a complete conflict of interest in, in what he's doing. So they both, they're all playing chess with the world. And the, the public is, you know, with psychopaths, <coughs> they they're too dumb. Psychopaths, as I mentioned, they will divide the room. And so, so this will divide the planet. They, they're just working their way in so that COP26, you know, will fall right in their lap because they're going to try and hijack it, the conversation. You know, everybody's going to be doing the same old shit, which is like promise, <coughs> make all these stupid promises that you, even if they, you know, were not empty promises, <coughs> They wouldn't achieve the goals required anyway for climate mitigation. So, but riding on the back of that, activists think, "Oh, well, then you know the revolution is going to start." No, it isn't. It's not. It's not a big enough shock to start the revolution. 
And then um, uh, people like David Keith are thinking, well, this is going to be our open door to say, like, we have to change the conversation now. And um, the, the following win, you'll get the benefit of COP26 because people will be more and more interested in an insurance policy. And so, yeah, it's, it's the most saleable thing in the world because it's, it's sold as rational, intelligent, and like, who wouldn't want a safety policy? And it's like, well, the analogy is a, an alcoholic. Is you don't want an alcoholic to have a, you know the moral hazard of saying, well, you know, uh, I've got the best health care. You say, like, we need to make sure that this alcoholic has gold-plated health care and, and um, has access to the best health care money can provide. That's not a good thing to do to an alcoholic. Then he says, like, oh, I can double my drinking now. Because he has the moral hazard of thinking, like, well, I've got a safety net. I might as well go, go and do a, a more extreme high wire act. And so, <clears throat> but, uh, they, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where they're deliberately steering it, is that they will steer us down this path. They know that the politicians are going to steer us down the path of catastrophe because they, they're pursuing GDP growth. And then they're thinking, oh, then we'll step forward with our great grand chess move. And that is, you know, we have the solution at a price. And then these guys will be, you know, in there as the Tsar and controller of the, of the climate. -ha 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 -ha. And it's like, these guys, you see, the they need to, you know, the same treatment that James Bond gave them in every movie. That that is the only treatment because they will lull the 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 um, the Pied Pipers that will just lead the public on. The public's not smart enough to see through this game. That's what makes it so damn dangerous. Even even PhDs and people that are you know should know better um, can't see through. But you know you you can. You can appeal to the public um, through, you know, because throughout history there have been all these warnings about Icarus flying too close to the sun and the, you know, Yiddish mythology about the golem and stuff like that. Um, so you you can appeal to people that there's so many stories about the hubris, you know, and like even Graham Hancock talking about the hubris of all these people in Atlantis. And so you, you can. Yeah, but you see, that's a kind of a, a memory in the background. That's kind of a reminder saying, you know, remember you are but a man. Remember you are but a man. You see, it's a, you know what that's from? When, when, the, when, the, when the, somebody got awarded a triumph in ancient Rome. So if you saved Rome, you got awarded a triumph. A triumph was, was basically you had are oh, incredible privileges for you know many generations so it, it was it's kind of like being made caesar when you were crowned caesar then you would have this big parade huge rules on exactly what's allowed at the parade and what the privileges are you get but anyway then the guy caesar or the guy who's getting the triumph the general he, he would come parading in a chariot and he would have a slave standing behind him. And the slave, they, the slave would whisper in his ear. The slave would be holding the laurels over his head and would be whispering in his ear, remember, thou art but a man. Remember, thou art but a man. Remember. <laughs> and so all these uh, tales that we have about playing God, Mary Shelley and all of this you know, Frankenstein stuff, we have that tape in our head. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing this. But it's like alcoholic. This uh, you know, alcoholics have a tape in their head saying, you know, you shouldn't be driving. You should be going home. This should be your last drink, and they they can't uh, resist. And the public, you know, we, we are clearly fossil fuelaholics. We we are energy economic growthaholics, and so you know, it's you, we will go with a, with a guy like David Keith and this basically shut down with extreme prejudice. You, you need shock value to sh you shock people shock people out of it. It really is the only way. You can't, you see, the more you get into the argument, the more you start talking against this and start applying rational arguments, the more he keeps up the snake-like monotone. 
and, uh, and beguiles everybody. It's basically, he's hypnotizing everybody. And the more you talk, the more you argue, the more you say how insane this is with rational arguments, the more you're actually normalizing it, the more you're habituating the, and getting the public used to this topic. So it's shocking at first, but that's going to wear off. And then it's going to seem more and more rational because you have the psychopath talking for long periods, you know, 20 years, getting on for 30 years. It all seems very, very logical. It all seems rational. It all seems safe because it's slow. You see, what he's saying is it's patiently done slowly, but slow doesn't work with the climate system. You can slowly do this, tickle the tra chain of the dragon. It doesn't matter. It will go into self-organized criticality and tip. And then it doesn't matter how slowly you approach it. Slow doesn't, you see this again, he doesn't understand chaotic systems. Slow doesn't mean anything. It's, it's basically, it's saying, well, I'm going to roll this, this, this snowball, you know, down the hill very, very slowly. I say, no, it'll tip and cause an avalanche. When it causes an avalanche, you can't roll it back. So it would be say so a basic thing about doing this kind of experiment is say you must not do anything that you cannot undo. So in other words, before you even start down this path, you must have an insurance policy that would be, you know, be able to cover the damage of anything you do. If suddenly, you know, there's one say hot spot, one dry place that becomes increasingly dry. Uh, is you must have an insurance policy that's able to cover that. Then, you know, well, then there's a bit of rationality involved, but look what would happen. They would immediately say, say to you, like, oh, no, we couldn't do that. Such an insurance policy would cost trillions of dollars. Say, exactly. So if an insurance company will not indemnify you except for trillions of dollars and you cannot afford that, then who's carrying the risk of this fucking experiment? Is You want us to carry the risk. You want to go ahead and do all these scientific experiments without indemnification. So you're saying, oh, this is our insurance policy. Well, what's the insurance policy against your experimentation? It's like, is somebody going to underwrite that? Nobody's going to underwrite that because it would cost trillions. Nobody would underwrite this damn madness. And that's the sanity of it. So the very first thing, so they'd say, oh, no, but therefore it means that we have to do it without insurance. Well, that's just saying that you, it's so crazy, somebody wouldn't insure it. But you going ahead recklessly claiming that you're being wise. It's come on, come on, guys. It's just so fucked up. Yeah, but that, that answers partly my question. But in, in my question, you see, the likes of David Keith and others like him, okay, um, even if once something happened to one of them, let's say, I don't know, an accident or something, they fell off a boat or something, um, there'd be another cohort of other guys behind with all these geoengineering projects. I mean, he's not alone. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people there. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, it's kind of bleak what you I mean in terms of um, awareness of the public, because as you said, most of us are too dumb to gather, to, to grasp all the, all the physics and all the all the all the um, all that's behind all this. So, so um, <laughs> geoengineering is uh, going no, to really uh, happen. No. So what history shows is that th these guys are all cowards. So they they have all this momentum and all you know public um, consensus, and they're all moving forward. But they they are out for gain, right? So they are they're playing chess. So, so what historically is if somebody actually stopped the game, you know, with extreme prejudice, they only have to pop off one or two, and that put a whole chill over the whole thing. Nobody would do it anymore. See, there, there, there are a lot of instances in, in history where, where that kind of thing has been the case. Of course, they'd all shout to the roof that they weren't going to let it affect them, and, you know, you can't influence us that way and stuff. They'd all say that. But you'd you'd find it would really really go off the ball. The re the reason is that there's there's this ghost of ghost of the dead man kind of thing. So, in other words, um, 
I've I've seen this in say engineering projects. Is you you get the say a guy pushing a line saying you know and engineering is competitive and you have all these ambitious project managers and stuff and all these different ideas on which direction you know technology should go in and so you often in a company you will see these you know guys get known for being the project A kind of guy. So, so then if you were David Keith, you'd be get get a reputation as being known as the nutty sort of radiation management guy. And then, you know, that would be your reputation. Now you'd you would gain momentum and as time went on, you you know, you would you, people would be won over to your arguments and stuff. Then it's suddenly that guy gets, you know, chokes on a fishbone. Right. So, what happens is that his ghost hangs around that whole subject. Then at the minute somebody, you know, the whole thing, your your favorite project, say solar radiation management, is whenever anybody brings up the subject of solar radiation management, there's a little or almost audible shiver runs down everybody's spine. And they can they can feel that that the dead hand of, you know, you it's kind of taboo to evoke the memory of Bob or whoever it was that pushed this technology. So although the technology, it, it basically it, it takes it takes it out of the rational and puts people into the into a fear mode and kind of out of respect for the the dead and fear it becomes a kind of a taboo area and subject. So when so it doesn't matter how great the technology is and promising and stuff, the fact it's associated with you know a bad burn <laughs> somebody is a it means that every time this topic comes up, somebody changes the subject and goes in a different way. And it becomes like that in, in the social the social thing. It became, you know, it basically, it's a kind of a there be dragons there. So you see, okay, let me explain it this way. What the psychopath is doing is he's keeping it in the, the left brain and he's spinning it up. He's spinning stories. He's perfecting his story so that, you know, when somebody comes and says like, it's a chaotic system, you can't control a chaotic system. He goes away says, finds an analogy from aircraft and how you know, aeronautical engineers controlled chaos and stuff, and then misapplies it and comes back. And then somebody like me would come and said, like, dude, they did that over 2 billion trials. With the Earth system, you get one chance, fuck it up once, chaotic uh, cascades you never dreamed of. So he's saying, oh, no, but we'll, then he goes away and thinks about that. And he says, no, but we'll approach it very slowly and carefully. And then somebody will say, it doesn't matter. Self-organized criticality does not have anything to do with how, how slowly you dribble the grains of rice on the pile. It just has to do with where the pile tips. It has the internal dynamics. You do not have access to those parameters in the climate. And you never will, because you can't model something we've never seen, you dipshit. So, the, so then, you see, but while all this is going on, it's all in the alien cortex. It's all being melted down. And what it's doing is ego fatigue. So the alien cortex has ego fatigue. The first, the first shock uh, of you know, uh, when you, you tell sane people about geoengineering is like, you can't do that to my planet. They shock that somebody could be so hubristic and play God in this way. So it's an assault on their ego. Then he's wearing this ego down like, you know, certification of rocks he's slowly eating away the acid eating away at the arguments and stuff then people are getting ego fatigue he's got a huge ego he's he's monomaniacal right he's a megalomaniac so he has he has decades of ego to come back and he's a phd from fucking ivy league university so he he's he has an ego that's you know titanium so he, he's, he's going to wear the public down, like drip by drip by drip of this acid. He's Mr. Acid. I think that basically we should call him Mr. Acid, give him a name like that. And so he'll use this, this kind of acid to drip away at the dialogue and eat away at people's ego till they get ego fatigue. Then it would be almost like, you know, oh, fuck, go ahead, David, do your fucking experiments. You know, we, we give up. You know, he gets to that kind of stage eventually. Now, what you're doing, the as he keeps spinning the plates and keeps running the story and does this 
Sherazade's story of, you know, on the alien cortex, keep the dialogue going, he wants to say, because then his car, the Python, can keep the hypnotism going. He's like, let me keep mesmerizing more and more people, is what he's saying. So, you see, it, he has to keep everybody in the left brain. The minute somebody, like, does something that shocks the, say, particularly reptilian brain, if somebody can make, put it in the realm of the amygdala, then, then it's a, he, he can't get it back into the realm of the alien cortex. So, so what propaganda the deed does is it, it shocks people. Then whenever they hear solar radiation management, they get a, um, a collection in their head to the amygdala rather than, you know. So, so do, you, do you understand the difference? It, 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 if, you, if you pass that kind of shock point, then when you raise this issue in a pub, say, then everybody goes, oh, stimulating, please change the subject. You're stimulating my, uh, my amygdala and reptilian brain. And, and it's taken away from the like, well, I think we should do, we might get to the point where we do solar radiation. I don't think David Keyes is out bad. I think you've got prejudice against people that go to Harvard. I think he's quite brilliant. He sounds reasonable to me. And it's all like blah, 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 blah in the, in the alien cortex. But if you, you can completely shut down the argument and shut down the thing by making a dramatic act that puts it forever in the amygdala. So it's like, oh, we don't want to go there <laughs> because we know what happened down that avenue. <laughs> so that's why you need to park it there. It's, it's really the only thing. If you, if you think it through, you'll see you can't engage it. The more you engage, the more you're wrestling with this pig. And the longer you're wrestling with the pig, you, the pig gets uh, what it wants to do, and that's habituate people to the don't, whole don't, idea. Don't wrestle with pigs, you get dirty. Um, I know, but uh, actually, I was reading the comments on um, on the video on YouTube, the the one that you posted on David Keith, and I, there was quite an amount of people. There was not many comments. There was about three thousand views, and there was about sixty, seventy comments. And um, there's a lot of them that are calling him a criminal, uh, or insane, or so. Uh, there is some people who are interested in the subject because that's a kind of a specialized channel, but there was can who can see through his um, his his talk and, and who are calling him a criminal. So uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, but this is the early stage, right? So you can see there there are a lot of upvotes and there are a lot of downvotes, kind of split fifty fifty, right? Which and the fact that he's pursuing this. In, with that divided room means that it's, um, you know, he's a psychopath. But the, um, uh, so um, uh, DT said that uh, one suspects that geoengineering will be applied by a country without reference to an individual scientist or engineer, there'll be global outrage. However, once the deed is done, it won't matter because it cannot be undone. Yeah, you see, once the genie's out of the bottle, you see, Everybody's, uh, you see, they, they're missing. There's all these hidden assumptions and, you know, grand um, sweeping assumptions. Um, so, if, for example, the, the assumption that David Keith mentioned was, you know, I think the question put to him in that video was, can, can it be done by a rogue billionaire? In other words, his master, Bill Gates. And he said, well, it's unlikely because, you know, if Bill Gates did it, he's, I'll put it in straight English did it in psychopathic circumlocution speech. But in, in straight English, the, this is how the, what the conversation was, was about. So he's saying, could Bill Gates do, do this unilaterally? And saying, no, because countries in Europe and stuff would, would put pressure on America to stop him. And so then he's saying it's more likely to be at a national level. In other words, he's saying it's more likely that India or somebody would start doing it. See, the thing is, if you see the 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 where it might be done is if there's a shocking natural event, like say a wet bulb, you know, um, temperature of over fifty three degrees in say Pakistan or India, and uh, a mass die off, uh, just just people, you know. You see, what, what would happen in there is the grid goes down. The grid goes down, nobody has air conditioning. And then you get some very, very ugly pictures in the news. Uh, more than disaster porn, you get people just lying from heat exhaustion in the road. Now, 
that's enough shock value for uh, there to be extreme hysterical reaction of fear. And somebody like Modi would be pressured in, into saying, well, the science is there, you know, do it. You'd have some guy like that, you know, general, who's, who's um, that, that general, the, the jiggering and the jaggering general, I can't remember what his name is. A guy like that is liable, could even come to power saying like, you know, we must stop the jiggering and the jaggering. We have uh, we have all the science. Mr. David Keith has done it. David Keith would get on an airplane and go and give them advice. And then, and you know, General Hotshot there would, would take over from Modi if Modi didn't do it himself. So it'd be cornered into doing it as a response. Now, once India did it, the rest of the world would go jabba jabba jabba, but you know, political correctness, uh, racism, blah de blah de blah, and then they couldn't say anything, and then the genie would be out of the bottle. Then, then India would say it's worked better. Look what happened in monsoon, monsoons coming back. Um, China might be in on it because you know they'd say like thanks for restoring the monsoon, and so they could come back with good reports. Then there'd be tremendous pressure. On, on the rest of the world to start doing it so that uh, instead of the local temperatures, the global temperatures were brought down and economists would be clamoring for it. So we can move into a very, very dangerous area. This, this, this is the, the kind of summoning of the demon that you just don't want to do. We don't want to get into this area um, because it's a quagmire. And so it's, it's just, you see, to hold, Hold on to your sanity. You just have to say, do, do we want to be able to control the climate? And say, no. It's one of those things you don't want the ability. You don't want ultimate control. It's, it's like, who wants that responsibility, right? You have to get up in the morning and say, are we going to go and you know, spread sulfates? Come war, famine. <laughs> Oh man, it's so crazy. I mean, imagine, you know, the the trigger points that you could be messing with here are extreme. So, if you if you failed, you would have to, you you would be in for the long haul. So David Keith thinks you can you can do it. We can all sensibly lower carbon. It'll give us time. Not thinking the obvious, which is actually the moral hazard of giving us no reason to remove carbon out of the atmosphere which he kind of accepts but doesn't know what to do with. And then, uh, other than say, hmm, but then, uh, and, he's, and then can tail it off. It's like, how do you know? How do you know you can tail it off? <laughs> he's saying, we, it'll give us time to adapt, and then we can stop, our, we can kick our drinking. So like, how do you know you'll ever get there? And then what happens when, when you know, this, this atmosphere is at 500 parts per million, and then some, you know, you're, you're assuming that making all these wild assumptions that the Earth system hasn't got all these black swans in it already. What, what happens if you get a meteor like Tunguska? What happens if the volcanoes suddenly go off? What happens if you get a meteor like Tunguska and it uh, it's, um, uh, basically puts uh, a big freeze, uh, the freeze on us? Then and you're going to have to try and like crank up the CO2 because because remember you're in control now so you've got to like respond to this event which the earth would stabilize after a while you are in charge now so you have to go and you know change the temperature dial uh, what happens in the meantime that time you you don't know what the hell you're doing that tunguska type thing if it landed in the mid atlantic or something the the all the CO2 is being absorbed by the the sea. We forget that. We think it's all being absorbed by the atmosphere. No, it's being absorbed by the sea. It's basically a big bottle of Coca-Cola. And if a, if a meteorite hit it and warmed it up, it would do exactly what would happen if you check a tennis ball at a, at a, <laughs> at a soda pop. It, it would erupt with CO2. And that's what the ocean will do. And then what? You you go you've got the thermostat. You're going to be chasing this demon. It's like you just don't want to go here, man. It's it, how stupid can you be? Well, we can be very very stupid in the in the pursuit of control, and uh, driven by fear. 
yeah, we'll get here in a heartbeat. That's why action should be taken to make sure that this area becomes no go to the point of a bullet. Yeah, well, I, I know what I would do if a guy like David Keith would come and trick or treat. I know the sort of sweet I would give him. <laughs> but yeah, um, is there a lot like him? I mean, I, I, uh, and no, the, you see, that's the thing. Is it's also a friend. You see, you got to like nip it in the bud. There are only 20, 20 of these nutcases like Ken Caldera. The thing, the thing that people are missing now and is, is worth highlighting over and over again is this is military technology. This is military technology. It's not civilian. They're all presenting it like it's civilian. It's not. It's made for warfare. So, so uh, somewhere buried in this is, um, is this, uh, this, idea that it's always going to be peaceful, the economy is going to be fine, we're not going to be at war. It's like, no, the first time we go to war, it's like civilians will not have, you know, it'll be treasonous to say anything against the government's climate program that is designed to defeat the enemy and increase production, you know, crop production at home. It, it would become treasonable. You could be sh shot for revealing secrets about it or, or for actually doing it. So, or, or, or actually speaking out against it. You could go to prison or be, be shot if we were at war and this is, a, um, this is military technology. So don't forget, this is military technology. You, they just, they're just faking you out. These guys like Ken Caldera, they worked for the military. They, all of this stuff has been developed for the military. And that, it's not, Something like, oh, hypothetical Star Wars kind of stuff is they used it. They used it in Vietnam. This was a key policy in Vietnam, was climate destabilization as a weapon. It's always been a weapon. So they're saying, should we get this military weapon technology and apply it in peacetime so we can grow crops and keep the economy going? That's what's really on the table. But they hide that aspect. They hide their backgrounds. They hide the fact that they're fucking psychopaths. Yeah, this this is a dual use thing, and it's it's um, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, the scientists are always so naive. They always think that because they have consensus and they all Boy Scouts and they go to conferences where they all you know, agree with one another. They think the world works like that. So the world doesn't work like that. The world is riven with opposition and competing interests, and nobody's going to work together to, you know, vote on the where to set this global thermostat. The, the terrible consequences for some countries. I mean, just do an experiment. Get an office room with 50 people in it and get them to, you know, put an office thermostat in, Crank it, crank it up to say thirty-five degrees, and then see what happens. What you know, I'll tell you what happens. Freaking argument breaks out in the office about where the thermostat should be set. You know, you think countries? If you can't do that in an office, you, you're going to do this on a global scale with nuclear armed countries. It's basically it's you're giving people a recipe for for a nuclear brawl. It's just unbelievable. The United Nations is not going to be owning this thermostat. It's going to be owned by a billionaire, in effect, through the channels of some country or something. But the countries are not autonomous. They're not sovereign anymore. The billionaires own the countries. A billionaire owns the country you live in. Get used to it. I was looking yeah, at... Yeah, speaking as... A, yeah. I was looking yeah, at some speaking as an engineer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, speaking as an engineer, we are trained to treat every problem as solvable, whether true or not. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of like uh, being a doctor, like like Sophie's. Like doctors get into this is because you take on the role and persona of a doctor. Patients come to you expecting you to fix them, whether you can or not, and then the doctors just do some flub. 
because they they don't want to disappoint people and say, yeah, well, doctors can't really do anything about this. Sorry. So that they, they pretend. They go through this big rigmarole of pretending that they can fix stuff they, they can't because they don't want to give up their status. And it's the same as, as engineers will do anything. They, they've been a, in this mindset, this Cold War mindset that they said, like, you know, we can go to the moon and do the other things <laughs> and stuff. And it's like anything is possible if you set your mind to it, is what they teach these kids at school and say, no, it isn't. So like, you know, touch your nose with your elbow and without breaking your arm. There, there's something that's impossible that even an, an engineer can't do. So shut the fuck up. It's like almost everything is impossible. Almost everything you can think of. The reason why we think that engineers can solve every problem is because we frame the problem so narrowly. But almost everything you can think of cannot be solved by engineering. It's a very vanishingly small uh, and, you know, li limited, smallly defined problem. And that's, you know, like, talk, just talking about the Earth's climate system is is hubris in itself because there is no such thing. The, the Earth doesn't have a category called my climate system. It's like it's all interconnected with everything. Everything is interconnected. So, you know, the, the butterfly effect in, in one tiny little area has an effect on the price of oranges on the other side of the world. So you, you cannot think in terms of, well, we'll be doing solar radiation management here, and it's for the climate. And this is the climate department. Do you think, like, well, what, what about the, the health department? What, what about the, you know, the, the guys that, uh, you know, in, who make the solar panels that now find that they're 5% less efficient and then they, suddenly they're not competitive with oil anymore and everybody starts moving back to oil. And it's like, you know, it's, these things are not contained in a little box called the climate. We're just modifying the climate. It's going to stay in this little box called the climate. It's like, there's no such box. That box is in your head. And your head should be in a box. So, I mean, the other day someone told me that even if all organisms die, billions of humans will be living happily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you see, we see, see this, it's the sorcerer's apprentice. You see, what it's likely to do is if you start acidifying the oceans, the problem is CO2 itself is carbonic acid. So it's an acid. And then David Keith was also talking about, well, you can put bases in the, in the ocean. But you, you look what you're doing. It doesn't work that way. You, it's, you know, how do you stir the ocean? You put, the, you put acids here, you put bases here. <laughs> it's like it, it doesn't work that way. The, the, you, you would kill off, say, the cyanobacteria with the acids because they, they're right at the limit of where they leach out the calcium. So they, they, the vertebrates cannot form. So there are lots of diatoms and krill and all these things which we never think about because they don't have commercial value. And so the krill uh, are eaten by whales. Whales, uh, whale poop is very, very important for regulating the iron content in the ocean. So you get you get the iron content, you'll get algal bl bl blooms that could kill off vaster arrays of of uh, microbes. So yeah, you know, through, indirectly through whale poop, you're fucking with the oxygen levels. And here's David Key saying, "No, no, we're monitoring the 42 parameters." Like Jesus wept. Just somebody, please do it. Just just do it. Just put him out of his agony. Keith dropped the bass. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's all about a bass. No trouble. Yeah, is a but. Do you see how you would run into limits? It's like like say say you you did all this and then you know what would you see? They think it's all contained in this you know response feedback thing, and so but. What's likely to happen is slowly you would get a drip feed of scientific papers saying it looks like, we're not sure, but it looks like there's some little disaster and it's hard to see how it's related, but we think it is closely coupled with this, so, you know, 
off it. Uh, then, you know, these guys would poo poo it. You'd go through these cycles where it would be first laughed off, then people would take it more seriously, then you know, people would fight it. Then, and you'd go, and eventually it would become real science. But what, when it's well down, you know, down the road from, from that point of view, and then it might be, okay, well, we're in the business of managing total management of everything. So now we finally accept the science. Now we, we find out, oh, the remedy for this is to put some bases in the ocean. So then we've got to, you know, so then we've got to go and find what do you put in the ocean that works as a good base and will circulate all around quickly enough to do this 10 year, to mitigate this 10 year accident that you've just done? It would be, you could really find out like, oh, well, that would take, say, all the lime in that the world produces. Oh dear, we just reached a limit we didn't know. So then you'd say, okay, we could we could do all the lime in the world, but we wouldn't be able to make concrete anymore, or we wouldn't be able to make you know CO two free concrete, stuff like that. It's it's like these guys need to go and learn systems theory and learn about complexity, and and then if if they understood even a slight bit, if they under, if David Keith even understood. You know, the first semester worth of, of complexity theory, he, he would stop this unless he was a complete psychopath, which unfortunately I, do, I diagnose him as one. The climate is uh, just a highly distributed system with embedded stochastic processes. How hard could be? Exactly. Exactly. And, and the thing is, we don't know what those processes are. We don't know how many dimensions there are, but I can tell you, they're infinite. The infinite, they go, you know, that, that's what, what the chaos theorists and Lorenz said with, with that paper. So, so if, if you see that Sabine Hossenfelder um, thing that uh, I, I posted about chaos, uh, there was a thing about the butterfly effect and what, and what Lorenz said in that paper was, if you do a grid of the climate, you know, and so basically say, well, we up to, up to now, okay, for example, like these, these uh, models that said David Keith works, those grids are up to one kilometer. So they don't, you know, like they only see clouds that are bigger than one kilometer, which already there is a bit of a fuck up. So that he, he, but what Lorenz is saying is if you double the amount of parameters, in other words, you, you, you know, you then have um, a grid that's uh, now has four little squares where you used to have one is saying that your uncertainty is only going up. Your certainty is only going up by the square. So you eventually you, it's a simple formula you top out. So if you had five days predictability uh, with, with a certain grid um, granularity, say a kilometer, then if you, if you doubled that and say it was half a kilometer, then you're only going up to about seven and then you double it again, you're only going up to about 10 days on um, predictable. But you, you're getting to a point of diminishing returns. Now that's a very dangerous horizon because the parameter that you're fucking with, which is the uh, albedo of the earth, um, you know, it, it might be on a completely different scale. It might be on a 30 day scale or a yearly scale or something like that. So you, it, your, your instrument would be too gross to see it. And so then you'd say, well, okay, we'll use lots of instruments or, you know, have a yearly scale. We'll monitor all we stuff like that. And you said, no, you won't because it's stochastic. How will you know that you're not looking at a statistical club? So, so then they say, well, we'd, we'd, um, we would put sulfates up in the air uh, very strategically. We would make a pattern. So I, I saw one guy, I saw that these lunatics did a paper saying, again, proving that they don't understand stochastic processes, that they said, well, we'll do it, you know, like intermittently. So we'll do it like a digital signal. So we'll seed the atmosphere with a digital signal, and then we'll be able to tease out our impact, you know, because, you know, we can actually see the digital signature as opposed to all the noisy signature, which is the temperature, the usual temperature of the earth. And say like, no, You've just made a very basic mistake about complexity theory, is that it's scale free. So what he's just said is, if we put a digital scale, then we can actually, you know, 
uh, we can we can tease out by making discrete inputs of sulfuric acid in the upper atmosphere, then we can actually see, read that signal and make sure that the concentrations that we are looking at or the temperature change that we are looking at comes from us and not from some other noisy signal. I say, no, you fundamentally can't. That's that's an axiom of of randomness. So so this is these guys don't understand a random process or pseudo-random process or the earth process, which is a stochastic, st semi-stable process. But the 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 uh, um, you know if if for example they're also basic assumptions. So then you can get cleverer still. You can be like you know Shannon and the signal to noise thing that I was talking about in the Darwin video. You could say, well, we'll be super careful to make sure that our cloud seeding, or not our cloud seeding, but our atmospheric seeding would be, um, was done at a signal that couldn't, could be distinguished from the background. In other words, you would use a Morse code signal like, uh, David Keith is a complete psychopath. You would do that in Morse code and, and you know, say of the days of the week or something like that. So that then you could read back your signal and be very, very sure that the signal coming back, you know, it's very unlikely that the, the climate system would just by chance manage to have fluctuations that would read out for the Morse code for the truth about David Keith, right? So, so then you could say, we're very, very sure that that signal is ours. And say like, but you, you're sure in a box. It's like, how do you know that, for example, this isn't, doesn't become military strategic? Maybe Putin's up there. He knows exactly what your signal is, and he wants you know the the thermostat dialed up or down in his direction. So he's fooling you. He's basically putting a corresponding signal to fool you. Maybe this is all you know military games or something like that. It's like it's like why? How do you make these assumptions that everything will go your way and will will all work like this? It's like it's like crazy oh shit. And then the next thing you do is the next thing we got to deal with. Is once you start down this path, it'll be you know the 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 geoengineering gap. Okay, here here's a Cassandra prediction from me: is very soon you'll get the geoengineering gap, and one of these Doctor Strange loves will say, <clears throat> Putin is going ahead with geoengineering. G is going ahead. Puba is going ahead with it. We must catch up. We we have a geoengineering gap. People in America, um, you know, we've we've been too concerned about playing God and stuff. And in the meantime, Putin and G have stolen a march on us. We must catch up with geoengineering. Uh, we, we're moments away from that kind of stupidity. So, you know, must act fast to, to show down. Uh, but Kurzweil says we will reach the AI thing here by 20. No, uh, 2041. Because uh, surely AI will save us from that. Yeah, okay. So so here's the thing is if AI, if you put AI on this problem, so surely somebody, Kurzweil or somebody will say, yeah. Kurzweil's already said that uh, we'll reach the technological singularity by 2040. <clears throat> and, uh, and so it, he's saying that AI will be able to sort out. Climate change and glo global poverty and all this because we'll have super intelligence and you know kind of like a phase change and mm. you super. Well, here's how would you know if you have a machine that says you know oh yeah yeah you go ahead you know stuff the uh, atmosphere full of sulfates you'll be fine. It's like you know put it you know dim dim the solar radiation by fifteen percent. Go on, you'll be fine. How would you know to believe it? There's only one way, and you're going to have to go and try it. And then you, and then the, the, the thing's going to go, ha, 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 stupid humans. They believe me. Now I own the earth. You know, it's hard to know you know that that's enough. It's so damn stupid what these guys are doing. Can I ask you a question there? Um, there, was a, there was a while ago, about a month ago, you posted or somebody posted on, on the red, on the sub, um, a video about, um, this American guy, I can't remember his name just now because I'm uh, Dane something. Anyway, is a is a guy who's who has got a website on geoengineering and he's claiming that it's happening uh, already. And I'm, I'm not talking about the military uses that happened in during Vietnam War and other other Chinese uh, um, experiments over the over Tibet and other places where I think there has been uh, some form of weather 
uh, modifying um, uh, techniques applied. But um, what what's your position on this is already happening, big scale, we're in this climate engineering already and all that? Because I'm, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable on that website. I went to see it and seen a lot of libertarian kind of shit on it too. And I, I'm kind of, yeah, wondering about it. Yeah, there's a lot of ignorance about it. So the the first problem is the geoengineering is being done on a massive scale, uh, but um, the various types. And so this particular one is solar radiation management. So the, it's these severely interventionist ones. The leading ones are, um, you know, I mean, planting trees is is, uh, is geoengineering. Just uh, the programs they've got in the high Arctic for Eco restoration are really geoengineering, and and some idiot will come. You know, you, you, it's only a matter of time if the subject comes up on Reddit before some stupid ass comes and says, "Oh, but we are reducing the planet with our with our CO two emissions and stuff like that." And you say, "Like, yeah, and how's that working out, moron?" So it's like there's this thing like, well, humans are already changing the planet, so therefore it's just more of the same. Is not a good argument. So. Uh, it's it's this uh, these particular ones. So yeah, this jet fuel. So jet jet A one and jets jet A one. The whole world runs on, apart from America, who has jet A. Jet A is a dirty fuel. Has a lot of sulfur in it. So so uh, planes already are putting sulfates in sulfur up in the in the upper atmosphere. Um, so it is correct that. Planes uh, and the contrails from vapor trails, not chemtrails, right? Chemtrails are not a thing. But it's it, it's almost like a psyops because I think that guy's just a lone nut. But uh, it is the kind of thing they do in a psyop because they make some ridiculous claim that is easily shot down. And then they put that out to cloud the issue. So then, then you know, the, it's very likely the obvious way to do sulfates is from from aircraft, and then you could just put something in the fuel potentially, and and do in essence chemtrails. Now nobody would, no nobody would argue because you've already established that that's a ridiculous, wild, not tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist thing. And so it, it, oh, the mere fact that you've established that and got all the liberals and the, the mainstream to poo-poo poo it on site means that it now opens the way for you to try it. So, so uh, yeah, are they doing it? Yeah, they're doing, China's putting sulfate, uh, sulfide in the, I mean, um, uh, what, what do you call it, sulfur? Oh, I can't remember. Um, uh, yeah, but they, they're doing it uh, from the ground. They're basically doing... Uh, so there's weather making, which is kind of different. If you do enough weather making, but China does it routinely. They do it for the Olympic Games. They, they do cloud seeding and, and stuff like that. So you, if you do enough weather modification, it becomes cloud... I mean, climate modification. But the thing is, is the, the uh, marine cloud brightening and uh, all of... Uh, these things, so, but uh, direct car uh, carbon capture is also climate engineering, and then you know you say, oh well, that's okay, direct air capture. And you say, well, no, it depends on how you drive it, and what's the energy source of your carbon capture is very, very important. And and again, it's very important that you don't bound it into a box where you you're using coal to run your air extraction technology, which is very likely. Uh, so, for a sci-fi movie on the 1% retreating <laughs> to lower the orbit, the Elysium starring Matt Damon, Holy, Hollywood for telling the future. Yeah, yeah the, the Bezos and that is, they're thinking in terms of, you know, a rich man's uh, escape strategy is instead of like taking a boat and going to sea, which is a poor man's <laughs> escape <laughs> strategy, is uh, you take a spaceship and go, go into space. But space is is not uh, a friendly environment, right? You, you've got to be within the, in low Earth orbit and extremely expensive to get on up there. And then you've got to, um, you wouldn't be able to sustain it for very long, right? The, the clock's ticking on you the moment 
moment you you have a space station it's like what the iss shows and what the biosphere 2 shows is that uh you you can't really recreate the earth on small scale like that the systems the too many systems like Drek paprika and on one of the videos said that the reason he commented that one of the reasons why the biosphere 2 experiment failed was because of phosphor they couldn't get the phosphor cycle to work i, th I thought it was the co2 but maybe that was a secondary one the thing that drove them out of that that bathosphere was the the co2 accumulation so they had to put a scrubber but if if you you know you have a, a scrubber up in space it's it's you've got to have a look at apollo 13 you've got your large-scale apollo 13 up there. and uh you know it's uh, the, the iss is a failure well it's a success if you take it from the point of view as it proves that space colonies are not possible but the iss roundly says that it's it's like campaign and it's a, a lot of systemic inertia that we even have the iss still going but the iss is is living proof that uh you know space stations don't exist um in in isolation up there it needs tremendous amounts of care and feeding yeah and we, we mine the asteroids yeah of course we do <laughs> i mean that that's like you know mining a, a shooting bullet so so we go up there and mine uh, a shooting bullet you know it's like whoa it's crazy i should you know how expensive that that would be and that's like ugh. but anyway it's part of part of our insanity so yeah it's um it's it's basically adolescent science fiction and again it's it's how we are failing to grow up so this idea of musk is that you know we we have an insurance policy. Uh, we become a multi-planet species. We we make sure we hedge our bets on humans. You know, some people living on Mars and stuff. It's it's all an adolescent fantasy, and uh, but it's indulged in our adolescent culture. It's basically accepted and celebrated to the point that people throw throw money, three hundred billion dollars, in the direction of this tech messiah. It's, it's a bizarre place to get to anyway. Well, I guess we've been going quite a long time, but um, maybe we should round it off there. And there's uh, any other questions or things people want to say? Yeah, Hollywood has done us a tremendous disservice. Thank you. Thank you very much for this expose. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's pretty nobody gets to, to hear all of this. Maybe we should, I don't know, you know, I think they like do write a book or something like Bright Green Lies or something like that. But Or maybe Hollywood should make a movie about the uh, geoengineering project gone completely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah there is there's there's, uh, there's these um yeah. what, what's it it's um uh there's a yeah there's a recent one about driving the planet cold it's called something about like snow plowing or something i can't remember something like that right. no hollywood is, is is making these movies there's the, the day after i think yeah. is one the day after something like that yeah, it's, uh, that's no, they, the, they're making them all the time but it's it's the same problem as the conspiracy theorists is because scientists can easily shoot them down for junk science so then you know they they miss the point so in in dramatizing it they they get the science wrong and then you know they they lose the point in they lose their credibility and in essence it's you know people go oh yeah but that was hollywood so no, yeah, that was Hollywood, but you missed the subtlety <laughs> of what could actually happen. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a way of clouding the issue. It's the tobacco industry's gamble. In other words. Yeah, just just cloud everything, cloud everything, and then carry on. So it's basically throw up, throw sand in the eyes, and keep moving forward. Yeah, but nevertheless, I think it's worth revisiting the the subject of geoengineering um, often and. Uh... This is not the only talk we should have on it, and we should we should keep going. And 
and I hope that there'll be some uh, some conversations about it and uh, during COP uh, and and comment some stuff uh, to XR, in, even though we're banned from <laughs> there. So, but we can stay. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's very related to, to AI. Um, it's, so, so all of these things are kind of interrelated. They all come down to the alien cortex. But it's very uh, surprisingly interrelated to AI and to the understanding of order and chaos. And so what David Keith is trying to do is to impose order on chaos. And, and that's problematic in itself. It's like, you know, what temperature do you pursue? Do you pursue a flat temperature or do you try and mimic the, the chaotic uh, temperature regime that we have now? See, if, you, if you're in control of the weather, you might, you might choose to say, well, we wanted a garden variety temperature. We, want, we, we might want to like dampen out the seasons. We might want to dampen out summer and winter. You know, we might want to dampen out the daily seasons. Or, you know, how much variation do you allow? I bet you they'd probably want it smooth. And then that that would be that would might destabilize it on their own. Trying to uh, trying to pursue order out of a chaotic system becomes um, its its own demon. So uh, I'm just pointing this out because it's highly related to maybe the next thing we should do is what exactly is a random number and what exactly is stupidity and intelligence in in AI. Because uh, it is related. Uh, have you read that Bill Gates has already bought the narrative? No. Are there any links? I've been waiting for this to happen. I've been trolling around trying to trying to see, but I've I've seen various people out of this psychopathic camp um, saying that you know this is a big chance we can you know hijack it. It's not on the agenda, but we can hijack COP twenty six for geoengineering. And and then I haven't seen anything really definitive. So, but I'm waiting for for this to become an outcome of COP26 is like, see, got to do geoengineering. Yeah, but any, please post anything you can on XL Med about Bill Gates and COP26, David Keith, Ken Caldera, and these mad, mad bastards. Okay, well, so uh, you might we just pause before we just go and just, kind of let all this shit go and go out and enjoy the day and uh, just do that by falling still. Oh, put them up and in them up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And uh, enjoy Halloween. Yeah, you too. Yep, all the best. <laughs>